Um, so, hi. Hi, how you doing? <laughs> uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Um, who you are, what you do, um, where we are now at the moment? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, so, uh, my name is Sebastian H W. Um, I'm a live artist uh, based in the UK. And uh, I make work that explores memory. Work that explores memory, technology, participation, um, technology, and the body. Wow. Um, yeah, quite a, quite a lot of view. Um, but I think and I came to that simply because looking back at the work I've made, those are the three key things that keep coming back. So I've realised I think that's really what I make work about. So it's kind of in retrospect, um, realising what it is I do. Um, I think that's it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, and you are with a Mexican descent yes. ancestry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk us a little bit about your journey, both as a human being, uh, as an artist? Um, yeah, maybe from those two perspectives. Okay. Um, so I was born in Mexico, mm -hmm. in um, Guadalajara, uh, which is like an hour outside of Mexico City. It's the second biggest city. Um, I was born there to um, my mum and my dad. My dad is uh, Mexican. Um, he's from the part called the, the Yucatan, which is a bit on the end of Mexico, if you think about Mexico. Mm -hmm. It's like Belize, Guatemala, okay. Yucatan. Okay. Um, fun fact, it's famous because the meteorite that killed the dinosaurs landed there. Really? Yes. Oh, well. <laughs> also famous for the Mayan um, civilization. Um, Civilization and my mum, uh, who is British English, um, both live there. So I was born there, lived there until I was seven, came to the UK with my younger sister, um, and we kind of moved around a lot inside the UK before we eventually settled in Birmingham, mm -hmm. which is where I feel I was raised and I feel I've got a strong uh, connection to. Um, grew up in Birmingham. Very interesting, difficult place, in kind of way. in some way. Yeah, I guess I think in some ways I feel more proud to be a Brummie now than I was growing up. I think it, I love the fact it's a very industrial city, really, and um, such a key part of the heritage. And I feel that I brought with me um, so I did like productivity making. Um, but I think as um, when I was growing up, the kind of making kind of radical performance work was very difficult to, I think. There's lots of great festivals that happen there, but unfortunately there's not a lot of year-round support, um, especially for you know, what I realised I, I am or becoming a live artist. Um, it's really good for like dance, acting, spoken words, visual art, but actually intersectional stuff, cross-sectional, very difficult. So uh, I went to theatre school, it was good. Mm -hmm. No, I, I started doing dance and then I went to theatre mm -hmm. school but successively I, I became less interested in um, so I started doing dance but I didn't feel that my body was represented in the bodies of the dancers I was trying to become um, went to theatre school also got very tired of pretending to be other people that I wasn't or being forced to pretend to be other people okay. particularly um, um, of different ethnic uh, racial stereotyping, so that was very complex. Um, and but actually, through the kind of theatre school, looking at like devising, I remember doing things like lambda devising. Mm -hmm. I was like, this is great. Yeah, you get to make your own thing. You get to tell your own story, a story mm -hmm. that you've made up mm -hmm. as yourself with other people. I'm like, this is what I want to do. Um, and then at college, my friend said, oh, I'm going to this like weird art school mm -hmm. um, called Dartington College of Arts. Uh, here's a prospectus, and he gave me a copy of the pros prospectus, and I was like. So I went down to the open day 
and just fell in love with it. It was like the middle of a field, completely alien to inner city concrete jungle that is Birmingham. Um, but hearing about the courses, and I'm like, this is the place I want to go. Mm. Um, so I left Birmingham, ran away uh, to the cows and fields <laughs> in Devon. Um, lived there for three years. That was great. Best three years of my life. Still work with people that I've met there. Mm. Definitely um, kind of expanded everything I thought I knew about what performance was or mm -hmm. could be. And but the only problem is that it's pretty insular, pretty small place, mm. again, <laughs> to make what I actually wanted to make. So I've always wanted to live in London, I've got family here, mm -hmm. um, and I finished my degree and I thought, this is it, if I don't do it now, I'm going to move back and live with my parents, and I'm never, it's never going to happen to me. Um, so I came, like, yeah, looking for streets of gold, no. and then <laughs> actually moved to Stratford, so mm. I'm going to back to Stratford, so quick note, where we are now is my studio. Um, in Stratford, uh, East London. And I moved here in 20, 2011, just before the Olympic Games. So just got really obsessed with all of that stuff that was happening. Um, Did the, you? Yeah, yeah. Well, so uh, I was in the opening ceremony. Were you? <laughs> <laughs> Very briefly. Um, mm. That was. How come? In what in the, the ceremony? In the ceremony. In the ceremony. Well, that just I had like thousands of volunteers, and okay. I was just I was really interested. In like, how do you make this kind of massive scale performance? Mm -hmm. How does anybody do this? Mm -hmm. How does Danny Boyle actually make um, this? I think uh, it was really interesting because it was all we all had these kind of intercoms, and we all had like time, mm -hmm. and it was like radio, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's like actually that's been quite bizarrely influential in my practice looking at kind of audio walks and mm -hmm. instructions and um, now like, how, helping audiences navigate the performance um, mm -hmm. that. so yeah I moved to Stratford and I've been kind of between London and Birmingham ever since depending on projects mm -hmm. um, still really like London I'm not sure I'm going to be here forever okay um, but I now really like Birmingham again I think Birmingham is kind of like definitely developed it's becoming more kind of open and, mm. and inclusive things. You uh, work a bit yeah. with um, Home for Home Waves and Strays, yeah. yeah. They're great. Like yeah. they're they're the group I wish if I had been growing up and they had existed, I mm. may not have left. Um, oh wow. Yeah, I think that they do a lot of really good year round kind of platforms and stuff. And is it a case of a combination Is it a combination between Birmingham as a place and the homes for um, Wait to the Street. Um, that makes you think that you would go there, or is it something specifically about your relationship with Birmingham or relationship with, with London that makes you kind of question that? Yeah, I think. I think when, oh God, I said it now, it's a question of when rather than mm. if, mm. leaving London. Uh, 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 oh, it's on go. record. It's on record, there we go. <laughs> yeah, this, no, I think so. Um, I will probably move back to Birmingham. I feel like, I guess I'm quite interested in this relationship of the return, this mm -hmm. idea of like what happens if when you leave somewhere, but you come back and you brought, you can, what do you bring with you? Mm -hmm. What is that, um, as much as what you've taken from a city? I feel like I've taken a lot from Birmingham. Mm -hmm. And I feel like still, I'm still in a point where I want to, develop myself as an artist and figure out what it is that I want I can bring back to a place. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not quite sure I'm there yet, mm -hmm. but I think I've come a point when I feel like, yeah, I think I'm going to come back to Birmingham and maybe give back. Mm. Start something that maybe should have been there that wasn't when I was growing up. Mm. Um, yeah, it would be time. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows when. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and what are you focusing on now, like artistically? Um, what are, not necessarily in terms of specific projects, but uh, things that are going to your head, 
uh, things that you're exploring with thematically or sort of practically. Yeah, I guess it's a really good segue um, mm. into uh, gentrification. Oh, yeah, hey, that old yeah. thing, yay. Yeah, yeah. It never <laughs> goes away. Um, yeah, so I think, and there's quite a key, the more I think about it, I think there's a big relationship between growing up in Birmingham and then coming here to London. Mm. And I think, I think about it a lot now, I think, and particularly my practice, what I'm exploring is kind of how, how artists can resist it and that role of, um, we're both kind of agents and in some level complicit within its perpetuation but also we have incredible privilege and we have tools that we can use to counteract it mm -hmm. and I think it's trying to kind of uh, organise and activate that and not dwell too much in the, I know, I, I don't, I, I never want to say it, but like the kind of victim mentality, there's a big problematic term around that but um, I feel often that be, that's that's a card we we play too play too soon. Mm -hmm. and actually, we need to kind of hop that card back and think. Actually, there are lots of other cards we have to highlight and build resistance within mm -hmm. communities, and that art can be a way of bringing people together mm -hmm. to kind of fight that in solidarity. Because mm -hmm. pretty much everyone is affected in it in a yeah. area, particularly London. Um, yeah. But so growing growing up in Birmingham, yeah. I think. We were quite wit we were quite witness to gentrification happening all the time, but it was very normalised. Um, it was often on a very commercial scale. I think if you've ever been to the centre of Birmingham, that has changed constantly. Uh, like even since I was growing up, mm. like I remember it being very different. Um, even, what's, even the boring, it's yeah. like it's a really whole good example. Like, yeah. it's a whole world yeah. within it, isn't it? Like yeah. everything kind of revolves around it as a city, which I find quite fascinating. Yeah, sorry, interrupted you. Um, so, but what's interesting then moving to London is suddenly how kind of politically active people were to resist it. I think being in Birmingham, you know, maybe I wasn't, I didn't notice it or I didn't know about communities and groups that were working against it. Um, whereas coming to London, it is, there's a lot more political activation against it, people trying to resist it. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel I'm, I'm quite keen, I think my practice at the minute is trying to learn what is being done, what are these groups, and what, um, what role. What role um, live art um, can have and also shouldn't have within the process of gentrification. Because often it can get co-opted into mm. art washing um, and that is not a good thing, and from my perspective. Yeah. Um, Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, art washing. So, yeah. it's a term that is it's quite recent. I guess a good example of art washing is when a property developer um, commissions an artist to paint a mural on the side of a hoarding mm -hmm. that surrounds their new development building. A bit of potentially a development that has displaced a form of development uh, like social housing. Um, so often art washing is mostly kind of more like public art, visual art, but I think now it's also being kind of being co-opted into live art performing arts. Um, in similar ways, in that sense of like creating oh, creative capital and mm. um, creating temporary events that kind of sort of boost morale and all mm -hmm. of that. Um, so I guess I'm interested in not doing that. That okay. role that live art can that shouldn't have mm -hmm. shouldn't have that role within that. Mm -hmm. um, that's a bit of a tangent there. Yeah. So I feel there's yeah. I feel I think I I reflect back on my growing up in Birmingham a lot with what it means to be here in London now. And see, like, reading and um, mm. being part of people who are really actively against it. Mm -hmm. um, does that change your sense of, like, you know, seeing the current uh, landscape of London kind of changing, or places that are usually inhabited by artists kind of having a, a very drastic change in the way they operate or the way they're inhabited? Uh, does that change your sense of uh, belonging to this town? Yes, yeah, definitely, because 
in some way it was something that I guess as artists or we were drawn to, I definitely was drawn to being in East London because I knew that's where I wanted to kind of continue to be a light artist and that's where I knew the communities there were and the support networks of like institutions uh, as well as individuals. Um, but at the same time, you can also see, even just being here within, I've been here seven years, no, eight years, um, seeing how drastically that kind of creative capital can like change uh, areas. Yeah, like I live in Stamford Hill, which is like just between Stone Newington and Tottenham, mm -hmm. and seeing that the kind of almost kind of leapfrog effect of um, kind of artistic communities moving from Stone Newington. Leapfrogging like over Stamford Hill uh, into Tottenham um, is quite, and seeing like how Tottenham is changing mm. from when I first moved there, it's like mm. really noticeable. Mm. Um, and also, what can we do? You don't have to have like a, a specific answer to this actually, but like, how the fuck are we gonna stop? Uh, local councils and local developers using artists as a as a as a kickstarter of the gentrification. Because yes. like if you look at for instance Brixton is a good example yeah. of that. Like, you know, ten, twelve years ago the council made initiatives on purpose to kind of get artists to come in and reside in the city, in the town. Um, so for very cheap prices and you know very affordable um, prices for artist studios and stuff like that. Which brought a whole new wave of Particularly white people <laughs> to the neighbourhoods, and kind of made it um, more perhaps what councils perceive as more socially accepted. Yeah. What and I suppose like uh, it's more of a sort of a provocation. Like, what the fuck can we do to counter doing that? You know, like specifically livelihoods for artists is so dependent on council schemes and and low rents and and affordability. That can we avoid being forms of gentrification yeah. in a way <laughs> yeah i mean we probably can't yeah um, yeah i can't say i have the answers mm. yet but i ever will mm. um i think what i at the minute what i'm researching is how or like getting involved with is mm -hmm. how can you kind of divest time energy resources into activist groups that are already working because mm -hmm. often what's and in that sense of learning about what has happened always has still happening wherever you've moved into and kind of getting involved with that, I think. Because those... Slow. Those groups have kind of already existed before we arrived and they're kind of... They, they need our support. They need mm. people. Just whether that's time, often it's not necessarily financial. Got, um, so at the minute I'm working with Focus E15 campaign, mm -hmm. who are based in Stratford, mm -hmm. um, who uh, in 2014 occupied a house here on the carpet of the state, the studio is, um, trying to look a lot at the, kind of like the archive and the, like the legacy, which is a big term that's thrown around uh, a lot post, both during and post Olympics, mm -hmm. um, into yeah, how, what, how can the kind of the privileges I have as an artist be used for their cause. Mm -hmm. That kind of sense of divestment, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. investing um, that back into actual kind of direct action mm -hmm. um, means.
So um, it's interesting to me that you're talking about um, gentrification and that being a point of focus for uh, the work that you're doing at the moment, but also how you as a, as a, a, a migrant artist of Mexican descent navigates the process of gentrification because it's, gentrification is quite a white middle class phenomena, right? And I wonder if you can uh, explore a little bit about your, your presence within gentrification as an artist, mm -hmm. but both as a white passing yeah. uh, individual. Yeah. Because uh, even though you, you are Mexican, um, there are specific traits about you that people might not necessarily yeah. deem as, a, as you know, the migrant. Yeah, that way. absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so, I definitely, yeah, I think I navigate it through the sense of knowing that I made a choice um, to kind of come to London, to move to London, I move mean, particularly to East London um, for, my, for lots of reasons, um, and thereby I'm potentially um, an agent of pushing out a community that is already here, um, further out of London. So, in terms of kind of like, kind of the problematics of like being white passing, yeah, definitely, I think, being both kind of um, having like a British passport, um, uh, speaking, you know, English, um, having, you know, having a white mother, um, I come a lot with that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's definitely something I think of, I try and think about. Um, but at the same time, I feel, I have been, especially moving to Stratford, I remember moving to Stratford in 2011 and moving to a house where like, no one spoke English, it was a house of just migrants, um, uh, particularly Eastern European migrants. Um, and that was really interesting, and then suddenly moving to somewhere where I can communicate with people. Mm. Uh, they can communicate with me, trying to navigate, living together. Yeah. But at the same time, I also don't think I have. It's a lot of. Um, I'm always skeptical about, skeptic about how much white privilege I have and whether how that sh shifts through time, through me growing up, um, and whether and that sense of whether it's something that is inherited but also performed, whether it's something that is um, through, I guess, through kind of taking um, through kind of you know, self-identifying as an artist, mm -hmm. is that is that not is that something that is owned by whiteness, not necessarily. Mm. So, big conversation to have. <laughs> well, own, um, define own. Yeah, define own. Mm. Yeah, whether I guess from my experience of like growing up and seeing that kind of, I guess only seeing that kind of um, being an artist was something. Most of the people that I studied and a lot of the um, the people that I look up to were were kind of white. Mm -hmm. So there was that kind of sense of, not role model, but seeing that sense of, um, to be an artist is to have a certain kind of white privilege to be able to go to art school. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that was, I think only quite recently, what I particularly like about being within kind of live art mm -hmm. circles is that that is something that has been dismantled, I feel. And more recently people, that space is being made for people who are not white who are not middle class, mm -hmm. who are not um, uh, heteronormative to inhabit and mm -hmm. take back, take back okay. that spaces. Yeah, I don't know if that answered the question. Yeah, yeah. of yeah. course. Um, the first performance I saw of you was a performance at um, a performance space in yeah. Hackingwick, back in the good old days. The good old days <laughs> of Hackingwick, <laughs> um, still there. Yeah, yeah, it's still there. Over the park over there. Oh yeah, we can see it's some yeah. kind of just see it a little hi. bit. Hi PS, yeah. hi Lada. <laughs> They're now not there anymore. Uh, no. So, yeah. But they're still with yeah, the, yes, yeah. in our hearts. Spiritual home. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I think that's where we met, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And at the time you were taking part in this uh, performance event, 
that were, and you did a performance called Checkpointo. Yeah. Did that to say correctly? Correct, yes. 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 Uh, Checkpointo with your dad. Yeah. Correct. And I remember I was really intrigued by it because I found that there was um, a really interesting kind of spark. and uh, dynamic between you and your dad because it felt to me like you were trying to find a sort of a common language, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, correct me if I read this really wrong, <laughs> but it felt like common language in the sense of like, uh, as a father and son, of course, but also as uh, migrants, as mm -hmm. people who uh, your dad grew up elsewhere for much longer yeah. and you grew up here for much longer than mm -hmm. either anywhere else. So it, it felt to me like a, a meeting point of different cultures mm -hmm. uh, but sort of similar heritages you know what I mean um, and I wonder how like how are these subjects in a way in, in that performance but also from your work since then the subject of like uh, personal heritage and common language uh, your Mexican Mexican heritage and your English heritage yeah. um, how that sen how that feeds into your practice um, yeah, does that, is that, yeah. does that make sense yeah. as a question? Yeah. yeah. I think, so with the piece you saw, mm. um, we were invited to perform at a festival in Berlin, uh -huh. um, and I, well before, but well, I got the invitation, and then I was like, oh, I really want to make a piece with my dad, and my dad was like, I really want to go to Berlin, and we said, well, mm. why don't we work together? Mm. Um, and I think, often when I work, um, I think at that point, and I guess there's element still to what, how I make work today, when I make work on my own, it often becomes a lot about the relationship with memory and like ancestry mm. and family, something that continually keeps coming up, um, for better or worse. Um, mm. And so I thought, okay, so it's something interesting, that's interesting, you know, dynamic we've set up, like both of us are going to perform live um, through our process, so my dad is a visual artist um, and a uh, poet. How do I then, how do we find a common language through mm -hmm. these two mediums? Mm -hmm. How can we bring both elements of that to be performed live? Um, and I, in my research, from bef like before I approached that piece, I always wanted to make a piece about, um, there's a, a, a story and news footage of a boy that was shot at the Berlin Wall, trying to cross over as a defector from east to west. Um, it's Peter, Peter Fechter. Okay. There we go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah. This week, I've got the internet out. Okay. <laughs> no, no, it's, I'm pretty sure Peter Fechter. Okay. Um, and he was shot by troops on the east. Um, but because he died, he was he was shot in the hinterland, mm -hmm. which was this contested space between east and west as a kind of like, not, not a neutral zone, but it's one of these zones that are created in particularly um, militarised borders mm -hmm. where it's meant to just be a no man's land okay. between two sides. Um, so that the border isn't exactly a switch, there's this kind of uh, liminal space uh, between the two. And he was shot and bled to death for an hour because neither side wanted to intervene to save him. Okay. So the, the West didn't want to jump over and um, protect him for, for fear of what might happen, um, and the East, they didn't care. Just so we took that story, um, and then we compared that with stories of uh, how um, young men are kind of shot at the border between Mexico and the US, and looking at the sense of like media and mm. uh, family and narrative, and trying to think about what, um, what are those shared stories between that. Mm. And then through that kind of story, we then through my talking to my dad, where I found out a lot about his experience, particularly of going trying to cross the border, mostly to work, um, mm -hmm. to between the U.S. and Mexico, and that sense of constantly being questioned, constantly being asked what um, what what he was doing, um, which is something that still continues today, mm. particularly uh, that, that president um, who we did not speak his name. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I think I just became really fascinated by the stories that he told, told me um, and trying to find ways of like, creatively like, representing them on stage mm -hmm. um, 
to clean the space. Um, yeah, and then we were like, okay, it was quite a process. I mm. think we came out of it thinking we definitely want to keep working together, but we're not sure whether. Mm. So it brought it like a lot of pieces. It brought out more mm. than actually we first anticipated. I think going, yeah. going back to more about, I think from then I've thought more recently about food mm -hmm. um, and heritage and family. Yeah. So the last show I made, um, chocolate. another embedded word, <laughs> <laughs> I love my embedded words, mm -hmm. um, was yeah, kind of a live cooking show looking at the history of chocolate because I feel that's the food that I identify most with. Mm -hmm. Chocolate having been invented mm -hmm. in Mexico, the cocoa bean being native. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but then having this long colonial history of moving to Europe mm -hmm. and traveling through Europe and then arriving to by Spain, Italy, France, into the UK, into England. Um, and cabbage chocolate being made in Birmingham. Uh, and I have very strong memories, one of my strongest memories of, of arriving in the UK is going into Cabri World, which is this kind of like yeah. mega corporate fun fair ride um, inside the factory. And the first thing you walk into is this fake Mexican mm. jungle. And you get, you know, lots of Aztec, like dressed up Aztecs and being given a taste of mm. Aztec chocolate and how much I hated it. It was awful. <laughs> but then that saying it was problematic. I'm like, oh, I should like this, it's my culture. Why don't I like this? Um, so yeah, the show's me cooking chocolate on stage, talking about that and problematics of uh, food appropriation, mm. family sacrifice. Uh, yeah. So and I, so I continued like talking uh, more collaboratively, talking to my dad, uh, but rep, but not performing with him on stage. More as this kind of as I would be recording, mm -hmm. looking at um, ancestry. Yeah. Okay. Um. So uh, thinking about uh, more contemporary. Um, sort of settings for you as an artist that there's a person um, but obviously this is uh, it comes with its own heritage and baggages I'm just thinking of you as a as a, someone who identifies as both a queer and a migrant mm -hmm. artist um, and you've discussed before how these two kind of things have an influence on you right I wonder if you could expand a little bit on how these two labels if you want to call them that um, or if you refuse to call them as levels, do expand on that as well. But um, how do they how do they contribute to um, you as a as a as a person who lives here right now and as an artist who's making work? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I guess the kind of the migrant label mm -hmm. is difficult because on the one hand yes because I've moved I wasn't born in the UK I moved here however I got the massive privilege of just being given a UK passport mm -hmm. to birthright with my mum mm -hmm. um, and I think that topic of like the passport is something that I've been thinking a lot about I recently made some workshops where we cut up a fake passport making office and uh, we made British passports um, Probably got some talking about some. Here we go. Yeah. Let's get one out for the camera. There we go. <laughs> go. This is, this is a blank one. Ready, nice. ready to be made. Um, <laughs> I'll take that. I'll join you on that. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it looks so realistic, doesn't it? Look yeah. completely. Bat an eyelid at it. Border control. <laughs> um, and thinking about kind of the, that privilege of being that kind of odd space of being both a migrant but also having an automatic privilege to enter the UK mm -hmm. and like uh, have all of the rights that that comes with mm -hmm. um, and also thinking about like who owns the passport like do you know all the passports are owned by the Queen? God, how many fucking things owned yeah, by the Queen in this country? Yeah, absolutely. And also the Queen because she issues a passport she doesn't need to have a passport so she can travel <laughs> anywhere in the world because yeah, she's the sovereign of the realm of uh, Britain, um, and yeah, all that. So that got me thinking. So mm. thinking about the ownership of passport, and with Brexit, mm. this idea of like what, what, who, 
how would the passport change? What does it mean? What does a British identity mean? What does an English identity mean? Mm -hmm. So I think I've always more identified as being British more than English. I don't, I've never quite understood what the English... identity means mm. in that sense and, and, and obviously it's, it's are they like Russian dolls it's like is one inside the other what is that it's an interesting one isn't it yeah. sorry it was just because I was having this conversation uh, recently with FK Alexander about this because we were part of this festival that was called An English Family right and then but the English Family title is part of it's like out of a Portuguese novel it's not necessarily to do with um, Englishness put it that way mm. um, of the participants in the festival and then we were like we were making a joke about how only of all the artists participating in the festival, only one was actually English. Yeah. And then we thought maybe we should call it a British family. Mm. Um, and then it kind of raised the question of like, oh, actually no, because that would bring a lot of other questions about yes. what is Britishness what and, British, and yeah. why Scottish and Welsh and Northern Ireland um, artists might not necessarily, or people might not necessarily identify as British. Mm. Because actually, British mentality or British identity is, is, is in many ways, is English identity. Yes. Like yeah. the idea of Britannia yeah. or Britain. Um, it comes from a colonial path as well. Yeah, absolutely. It? Yeah, and I think yeah. it's important to acknowledge that mm. that complexity of. I also have both being kind of having a kind of colonised past in mm. terms of being Mexican, um, but also being a, having a colonial colonised past through really yeah. Britain, and that yeah. kind of set up this com this um, complex kind of like meeting of what? How do you? How can you be both? Mm. Can you be both? Is that mm. a contradiction in terms of oxymoron? Um, but I think I definitely, I definitely have always felt more British than I have English, mm. because of the sense of needing to acknowledge that English have been have created the British Empire, um, and that is something that you need to think about, and you need to kind of find mm. ways of what does it mean to you? How can you dismantle it? How do you understand? and bring to light that history. I remember how little we were taught mm -hmm. that what the British colonial history in that school. It was all uh, medieval, Tudor, all of that kind of like golden era when we were an entirely insular uh, nation actually when it comes to kind of 18th, 19th, 20th century. That's just, we're going to just skip to World War II and remember how oppressed we were uh, or like how, how difficult it was for us to fight the Germans. And that's very cleverly forgotten and erased. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, with all this in mind, um, you have a, a, a new project coming yes. up. Yeah. Transient borders. Yeah. Bo borders. Borders. Yeah. Borders. Like hotel, bo like borders. Mm. B o a r d e r. Okay. Uh, obviously, play on word, but actually, it's a technical term in mm -hmm. hotelier speak uh, uh -huh. when. People who are living in a hotel for longer, who are considered residents rather than kind of temporary guests, uh -huh. they're kind of considered transient borders. Yeah, sorry, so Hotelier, yeah. Um, yeah. Speak, yeah. Yeah. Hotel Transit Borders. Um, so that is a project where I am interviewing uh, people um, who've been displaced out of London, uh, who've gone to live. Some, most, actually, most of them are not um, at the minute hotel borders, but displaced out of London and living in cities outside, uh, around the UK. Okay. Um, So I've been interviewing people that I've met through working with the campaign group because um, okay. they've got the strongest like connection mm -hmm. um, to that particular group of people. And I guess what I'm interested in with this project is, in some way, I think I'm kind of thinking ahead. 
might be sooner than I want of mm. um, that question of how will I anticipate how do I how do people anticipate what it's like to move to an entirely new different city how do people make the best of a choice um, that was kind of given to them and how that kind of reflects my own um, reflects kind of my own narrative of being um, of a migrant arriving in the UK and moving around the mm -hmm. UK to living in different cities um, and might be my eventual narrative of moving out of London potentially back to Birmingham trying to kind of create a kind of what is that relationship between those stories um, what's it going yeah. Yeah. yeah so it's definitely in development yeah. Yeah. Means uh, means a lot of travelling. Okay. <laughs> around around, around the UK. Um, most of the people um, are kind of within, and not that far from Birmingham, like Canterbury, Brighton, um, Birmingham, Oxford. Mm -hmm. So I've gone so far. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I'm interested in kind of what are their memories of London? What was it like? What did mm. they feel? It's like being here. What was it like to suddenly arrive in a new place and kind of navigating that sense of in a sense, kind of being um, kind of infranational migrant, in a sense mm. of not, is migrancy just something of crossing the border from one country to another? Mm. What happens if you're then that sense of movement, the transience from one? Um, one home to another. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Great. Um, and when can we see this? You can see this. Uh, <laughs> here's my plug. <laughs> um, at Theatre Delhi Southwark, which is the okay. old uh, library, Burgess Park. Here in London. Here in London, yeah. Yep. Um, part of Scratch Night on 11th of June. Okay. Yes. We'll put that on the website. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Seb, thank you so much. No worries. It's been thank a you. pleasure. It's been great. Thank you. Um, we will put everything up online and all that. But um, this is Seb. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>